Church Online. My name is Omulemo. It is such an honor to be hosting you this morning. It is spring day today. Happy spring. It's so exciting. At least we don't have to worry about the cold anymore. Speaking of new seasons, I know that Craig will be starting a new series and I'm super excited about that. And another thing that we do have at church, we do have re um, renovations that are happening. It's so exciting. I'm sure you can see some of them happening right behind me. And um, before we get into it, I know that we do have business forum happening, um, so check out this video. When I sat in the in the forum today with the people that were in my table, I got to um, hear answers of questions that I never even asked, but those questions were already in me. So those questions um, were answered in terms of where I am, with life and uh, how I can actually reach the full potential of the purpose that the Lord has actually outlined for me from the beginning. You're going to have time to think about things that you normally wouldn't think about. It, it gives you a breather. And here it's actually where you can also focus on yourself because so many times people just don't have time to focus on themselves and just to take a breather and then see what do I need to do next. And I think that this morning did that for, for many people. So the biggest takeaway that I received today from the uh, business forum here at Urban Life was literally that I needed to know how to speak to people and how to connect with them and then take my own problems that I have, learn from it by questioning that problem. And the preparation, like all that was put in from the food to the table arrangements, I just really felt um, taken care of and I, I really appreciated how much effort and how much was put into being served today from the team. But the biggest thing or reminder to me was the gift of community and how we need to tap into that. It's such a treasure, it's such a gift to us um, and we need the people around us. God created us in community on purpose. Just come, <laughs> gotta do it. Everyone needs to come to Business Forum regardless of whether you're a top CEO or a young professional starting out your career because you find connected community. And if we look around our city, our country, our world, we need leaders who are able to solve problems in a connected community. So you need to be there. All right, so with me right now, I have Modalo. I actually wanted to ask you, what led you to um, giving your life to Christ today? I think for the past few years, I have definitely strayed away from that decision. And I thought okay. today was definitely the time for me to actually renew it. Now I know that it's a life that I'm fully going to commit to and dedicated to commit to, even on days where, yes, I'll have my struggles. Yes, I'll yeah. have everything else. Okay, so with me right now, I have Chris. Craig's re message really spoke to me today. Um, yeah. I, I relate myself very closely to James. Um, yeah. I was a non-believer. I eventually came to Christ and now I've, I'm kind of finding myself to like to reach a point where I actually want to pass the word and preach the gospel, yeah, minister beautiful. the word as much as I can. That's why I've started in kids ministry here at, at wow. Urban Life. In which ways do you think God can actually renovate your life? I think humbleness. I think if if I can if I can definitely set myself aside and continue to to act in, out in the ways of the spirit instead of out, acting out in the ways of the flesh. And I cannot wait to see what God has in store for you throughout your journey being here at Urban Life. So thank, thank you so much. Okay, so I have Gloria here with me. I really was impacted by the analogy of like monitors, right? Like you know we have monitors on our phones, on our yeah. smart watches, etc. Um, but what do we have for like the entirety of our yeah. lives? And yeah, like you said, we have our Bibles at our bedside or on our phones, but how often do we plug into that and let it actually monitor and give yeah. us feedback about our entire lives? It's so good to be together, especially as it is spring day. And Warren, thank you for your very kind words. I get the privilege of living with her 
um, and all the kindness and the bravery. Um, you thought it was from me, but it's actually not. It's from her. Um, and um, uh, not often that Sunday's fall, uh, the Sunday, the 1st of September, the 1st of September falls on a Sunday. The last time was 2019, so that was five years ago. But um, I do want to just say happy birthday, my darling. Um, you know, the, the thing about Andy and, and that she has endured 30 years of being called the pastor's wife. And that's something that I know that we have fought against in this church. Because, not just because, you know, you know that I don't, we, we don't like titles. There's nothing special about us, but we are involved in a very special work. Um, we've never tried to enforce titles, and no one else talks about the accountant's wife or the lawyer's wife or the IT's wife. And so why do we talk about it as the pastor's wife? And I want to say that you have as much equality and dignity and worth, if not more than I do. And it's together that God has used to do and build this magnificent church, which belongs to him. So I want to say thank you. You're brave. You're kind. You are gracious, forgiving, loving, full of joy, beautiful, um, and well-dressed. Amen. <laughs> Because I had to dress her this morning, you know, it's like, like every morning, what do you think, how's this, what is it, does this go, no, that doesn't go, no, no, and then whatever I say, it doesn't actually matter because she wears whatever she wants anyway. Isn't that true about that, husbands? I mean, it's always like that, what are we? We're not even a mirror, you know, anyway. Um, so we're in a new season, it's spring, and any one of you saw some of the graffiti on the walls? Who was that? Um, we decided and felt real impressed by God as it's a new season to do something new and to bring up some changes and renovations. And so we uh, are excited about what God is going to do in the natural with the building and with our spaces. We've been busy for a while, you've seen. But uh, on Tuesday, I sat with the staff and I said, on Sunday, everything changes. They go like, what? I said, yeah, the food is moving to where it should be. The, the, the guest lounge or the, the, the life lounge, as we're calling it, is moving to where it should be, where we want it to be. But it's not finished, Craig. I know. But so what? It's moving. So there was a lot of moving. And then we said, well, why, why are we moving and changing? Let's do it all. We've been dreaming about changing the entrance to this building for certain reasons. Um, and I know you're going to go, but you take it away. You belong here. Yeah, we're smashing it out. So if you want a photo on it, please take it this week because it may not be here next week. We're not sure. All right. People go, but what's coming back? Something way better, all right? So we are renovating the building. We're renovating these spaces. Why? So that we can get ready for what God wants to do. And so all of these things are happening, and um, I would encourage us to, to uh, get alongside with faith. And as Warren has said, let's sow into this next season of change. It's going to cost a couple hundred thousand rand as we move and shake and change Things, but let's do it with, with great generosity and love for this house. Amen? Brilliant. So um, how are we doing at life, guys? I mean, really, how are we doing? How are you doing? If I had to ask you one to ten, how are you doing at life? Just kind of give yourself a, a score out of ten. What do you think? I mean, you don't have to say it, but uh, how are you doing at life? Because I think a lot of us would just go, yeah, we're fine. Like, how are you doing, Craig? Fine. And inside I'm going, hmm. Um, and uh, I asked ChatGPT, all right, okay. I asked ChatGPT and I said to, the, I said to this um, AI, um, what are the everyday issues of life that we modern day people face? And it spat out 12 things. Now, I would have gone, Physical, mental, spiritual, relational. I think I got to about five, financially. So this thing spits out top. Let me quickly, stress and mental health. How are you doing? Managing stress from your work, coping with anxiety, depression, balancing personal well-being and responsibilities. 
How many of us are, are in that space? Woo. Uh, work and career challenges, like job stress, work life, job insecurity, navigating career changes. What about your financial pressures? In a recent uh, survey that we did, um, the number one issue, financial, the most stress, the most uh, difficult area in our lives, financial. Financial pressures, budgeting, debt, loans, financial planning, saving for emergencies, retirement. Health and wellness, number four. Maintaining physical health. Come on. Relationships and social connections. Ma managing, maintaining healthy relationships. Managing family responsibilities, caregiving, coping with loneliness, social isolation. Uh, time management and productivity. Balancing work, pe uh, personal time, managing daily tasks, overcoming procrastination. Oh, yeah. Home and living environment, household chores, maintenance, managing the lawn, housing, affordability, security, relocating, adapting, personal development and purpose, finding purpose, meaning, fulfillment in life, setting up, achieving personal goals, dealing with feelings of inadequacy, self-debt, parenting of family and life, raising children, managing family dynamics, balancing parenting, oh, navigating education, technology and digital life, managing screen time, digital distractions, navigating social media pressures, online interaction, cyber security, life transitions, oh, adjusting to a major life change, uh, environmental and so, anybody you tired of me already doing that? All right, now how are you doing at that life? Anybody? How many of did your score go down? Minus 10. Now, guys, I just want to say it's not an exam that we kind of have to pass 80% A student. Woohoo! I'm an A student. It's more like, let's take a real assessment of our lives and then say, how can we better it? How can we uh, improve from where we are at? There's no failing. There's no passing. Because the problem is when we think we've passed, what did you do when you passed your, your worst exam at school, university, wherever it was, you kind of, I passed. Good riddance. How many of you remember even 10% of what you studied for? Isn't that true? This is not an exam. Life is not an exam. Life is there to be lived and lived to the fullness. I think that we would all, how many of you would like an app that you can download on your phone, stick a ring on your finger that monitors all of those 12 things and even more? And you could just go on there. Right now, we have an app that is monitoring the solar on our roof and can tell us how much solar is being, how much energy is being produced, how much is being um, used, and the whole thing, isn't it? We've got these apps now. You've got a health app. I think Apple has been really good at those and others. And you go like, how many steps did I do today? How's my heart rate and, that, heart rate and things like that? But anybody got an app that is monitoring your stress level? That's monitoring your relational issues. We have apps and our banking app can tell us how much is on our balance sheet, but it doesn't tell us how generous we are. Hmm. And I think that we would all, if we had, it would be the favorite download if we could just monitor. Maybe it wouldn't be because we would find out how we really are. Andy Stanley has this saying, and he says this. He says, following Jesus makes life better and makes us better at life. Following Jesus makes life better and makes us better at life. And as much as I believe that to be true, I don't know that I'm walking in that. Are you? I, I, I battle with it. Because Jesus said it this way. He said, I came so that you can have real and eternal life, more and better life than you've ever dreamed of. John 10.10, 10, in another version, that was the message. In another version, it would be, I came to give abundant life, or life that's more abundant. A life that we could never even dream of. Are we living a life that we even could not even imagine? And I think in some areas we are. But in many, we're not. I think they say in the early years of our lives, we, we strive for success. 
It's kind of in those early 20s, maybe 30s, that we're striving for success. And then something changes, and we look for significance. We want to we, we wanna make a significant contribution to life. 30, 40 years, we're into this. We know we're in the mid. We're going to make, we want to do something significant. We want to change the world. And then somehow the, the clock ticks over, and the next thing you find yourself wondering, well, actually, did the years that I lived count? I would say that I find myself in those things is that uh, we can't physically, emotionally, all these areas. I, I, I believe that God is giving us a moment and a time where we could actually assess and make some changes. We're going to take the book of James. Say James. Now, in, 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 in the... New Testament, and then the Old Testament, that word was Jacob. So in, if you go to uh, Brazil, uh, it would be Tiago, James, Jacob. And the book of James is found just after Hebrews. Um, and we're, I'm believing that this is that the book of James will be a tool to break down the unnecessary and build the essential. To break down the unnecessary, and to build the essential. One of the things that I realized, and we've been renovating um, a little space at our house in a, for a, to be a one-bedroom cottage, um, and I'm a builder. I love building. I love changing. We built this. We built the buildings, uh, but we're renovating here as well. It's around redemption. It's redeeming spaces. What was beautiful is no longer. God brings about a time and an opportunity to redeem, to, to, to change things, to renovate. But I think that for most of us, we don't like to renovate because we don't like to break down the old. Yes, that's me. We don't like to get the new stuff in our home because we hang on to the old. And so we live cluttered lives Hanging on to old things, not all, but I'm saying for much. I think the inner, the sort of um, our natural man, the part that is influenced by the enemy of heaven, wants us to hold on to, wants us not to get rid of what is unnecessary so that the essential may come. And we always tend to look at, it's quite fascinating, as I took a spray can and just did on the wall, this wall is coming out. And, and everybody walked, not everybody, but people walked in and saw, what are you doing? Do you belong here? Do you know that people walked in this door and when they saw that, they knew that God had spoken to them. Now you're taking away the finger of God on the wall of the sanctuary. I'm going, good, I'm taking it out because then it's becoming religious. We're believing in a wall rather than in a work of God by His Holy Spirit. In the, because when we had, previously to that, we had welcome home. And people had the same message. Do you know that? They came and said, it's like we walked in, we just felt welcome, this was home. Oh, this God spoke to me. Do you think that God can only speak to people through that wall in the entrance? Now we're going to continue to put what we believe God is saying, but let's not get the wrong uh, belief. And so sometimes God has to break down the unnecessary so that the essential may be built. And we're taking the book of James and we're going to say, God, would you come and renovate life? Would you come and renovate life? Now, not just our lives, but renovate life. Help us to do better at life and be and better, what's it? Help us to, to do life better and be better at life. Maybe you should, and we can, just take those, take things and just do a self-evaluation, write it down, give yourself a, a score, and then come back a year later and see, has anything changed? How about that? Let's go to the book of James. So we're going to do this, we're going to go through it, and we're going to ask God to breathe through the Word of God like we have been singing. Come breathe on us, Holy Spirit. Breath of God, would you come and get dead things, make dead things alive? What is dead in me that needs to live? 
And what are some of the things that I'm putting a lot of life into that need to die? What walls need to be broken down? What spaces need to be renovated? And I believe that we can trust God for the best app in the universe, the Bible, to as we read it, it will read us. And the Holy Spirit, if we will listen, we don't need a watch or a ring or an instrument. What we need is a living relationship with the Holy Spirit that would help us understand and know, and He will help us renovate the areas that are so necessary. Do you believe that? Father, I'm asking you that you would come and breathe upon your people and that you would take your word and that you would make it living, active, helpful, incisive, that you would, by the power of your Holy Spirit, break down which needs, that which needs to be broken down, the unnecessary. Would your word build back the essential? Would you bring life where there is death and where death needs to come, would you curse that? So, Lord, we're asking that this time, this morning, and our week and our next few months as we travel through your word, that you would speak loudly, that you would do a work of grace, a supernatural work in every one of us for your glory and honor. I'm asking that. Amen. And amen. James chapter 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Do you know that this book is the earliest written book in the New Testament? So of all of the books in the New Testament that were written, this book was written first. So written about 80, 50, some put it a little bit later, some put it a little bit earlier. We don't know the exact date. And this book was written by the brother of Jesus. Now, some say he is the half-brother of Jesus. So you'll see that a lot is that there's the half-brother because, he, you know, Jesus was immaculately conceived, Emmanuel, God with us, in Mary, Joseph had nothing to do with it, and then he had everything to do with the other brothers and sisters. But no one called him the half-brother when he grew up. He was... They were brothers. So we're going to call him the brother of Jesus. James, the brother of Jesus. Seems like James was the, the, the second eldest. Jesus then came James. Now, um, uh, let's have a look at, at this because um, maybe we should get to know James a little better as a way of, to more, this morning is a way of introduction. I'm hoping and believing that as we go this way that you'll begin to read it and let the Bible read you and that we will interact with this like we interact with our app, our apps, our social media, <laughs> all right? But that it, this would take precedence, all right? So if we have a look at this, let's go to Mark 6, uh, verse 3, and that's where we encounter um, James, the first in, in the Gospels, all right? So Mark chapter 6, verse 3 And Jesus came to his hometown, Nazareth. This is where he grew up. This is where he would have spent his time. And uh, on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And people began to go like, well, where did this guy come from? Where did he get all his wisdom? He's the, he's the, and we have translated this word tecton as carpenter because we love the nostalgia of, of, of making nice wooden things. However, this word was more in that day akin to being a builder, an architectural builder, someone who built. Yes, in those days when they built, they built the house, the door frames, the door, the windows, the tables. They did everything. Today, we have specialized people. When we need a kitchen, we get the kitchen guy in. Then we need the plumber. Then we need this. I remember speaking to my father, who was a master builder in, tw in, the, in, in 19, 20, 30, 40s. And he, he would say to me, Craig, um, in those days, we did everything right from the beginning to the end. 
We made all of the kitchen cupboards, all the doors, all the door frames. There wasn't a hardware to go to. What you did is you bought the material and we made everything. That was more what Jesus would do and would have done. In the family business, he would have done everything. Yes, he would have worked with wood. But the, 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 the invention of concrete or the very early stages of what concrete would become was invented around the time of Jesus. Now, I have no proof of this, but I do believe that the creator of the universe would have been involved with some concrete work somewhere. <laughs> all right? You'll see one day. We'll watch the heavenly YouTube and you'll see it, all right? He told stories about it. So James would have been with Jesus in the family business. And so what we see here is in verse 3, it says, Is not this the builder, the son of Mary? So it seems like Joseph has passed away. And the brother of James. So it looks like James was more famous than Jesus. Because they go, he's the brother. It's like, and he's the pastor's wife. Why do we do that? But they go, he's the brother. Jesus is the brother of James. Well, James had now taken over the the building business. And Joseph, Judas, Simon. So they were the brothers of Jesus. And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. So here we see the first mention of this writer of the book of James. You got it? Turn to John chapter 7. John chapter 7 and verse 5. And after this, Jesus, well, I'll read the, th- the, the first part. He would not go about Judea because of the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews of the Feast of the Booths was at hand. So his brother said to him, leave here and go to Judea that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. And then verse 5, this is it. Not even his brothers believed in him. So here is James and the, the brothers of Jesus. John says his brothers didn't even believe in him. So we understand that the writer of James, he did not believe in his own brother Jesus being the Messiah. All right? So if you don't believe in Jesus this morning and you're here, you're in good company. His brothers never did either. All right? Let's go to to Acts chapter 1, verse 14, because then we see something significant happens. And it says, All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Wow. So something happened. Between John 7 and Acts 1, the brothers believed. There was an encounter. There was an understanding that the brothers who didn't believe that their brother could be Jesus the Messiah became believers. All right? So that's where we see it. Let's move on. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now, this is a fascinating scripture. Everybody okay? Okay. We're doing study now, all right? This is how you got to study the word. Go and take the name mention. I'm trying to help you. Is that okay? Where am I in my time? I've got some time. Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 3. It says, For I delivered to you the first of importance. This is Paul now. He's writing to this church in Corinth. And he said, What I've also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures that he was buried, he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and he appeared to Cephas, which is Peter, then to the 12, those are the disciples, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, even though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to who? You know what? I've missed that. I've read the Bible multiple, I mean, many, many, many times. I've never seen that Jesus actually came, singled out his brother and appeared to him. Because then he says this, um, 
Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, to the one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Now, it's unclear whether Jesus appeared to James before he ascended, but it is here that Paul, we know, Jesus appeared to him after he had ascended to heaven. Because Paul only got saved in, after about five, six years after Christ's death. So I'm not sure which and how on that appearing, but somewhere along the line, James and Paul got together and they kind of swapped notes about the appearing. We have more about what Paul and how, you remember, he was on his way to Damascus and he got uh, uh, blinded by an appearance of Jesus himself saying, why are you persecuting me, Paul? Now, I don't know, and nothing is said about the, the, the revelation, the appearance of Jesus with James, but it happened, and I got a, like a feeling that something significant happened in that moment that changed James' life forever. Okay. Acts chapter 12. We're finding out who this man James is. The, the scripture, you thought, who is James? We didn't even know that James and what who it is. Now you're finding out a whole lot about him. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. James chapter 12, verse 17. Uh, sorry, Acts, Acts James 12. There is no James 12. It's Acts 12 and verse 17. And it says, but motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how now they had just come out of, Peter had been in prison. And they came out of this uh, uh, place, they had been, the, the, the disciples were praying. He says, motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison, this is Peter, and he said, tell these things to James and then go to the brothers. So he singles out James as an important person, of which we're going to see now. Why was James important? In Acts 12, James had risen to a place. I'm going to give it to you. James had risen to the place of leader. You would, today we would call him the pastor. They never called him that in that day. Nowhere in Scripture do we ever see anyone going, Pastor James, Apostle Paul, Paul the apostle, James the leader, James a pillar, never. That's why we go, please don't call me Pastor Craig. Because then you're going to have to say the pastor's wife. And we don't like that. <laughs> now, if you want to say, take a sledgehammer and break down the unnecessary and just start speaking the essential. You get it? I know you may have come from places that go, oh, pastor this and pastor and pastor. Let's take a sledgehammer, smash it down. Why? So that you can build the essential. You get it? So here we see Peter didn't say, oh, to the mighty man of God. He didn't say to the bishop, to this. He just said, go and tell James. Am I breaking down some religious... I nearly swore. It's not as vivid, but I better not say it. All right, let's move on. Let's move on. Uh, let's go to Acts chapter 15. Now, there came a big dispute in the early church here between the, the Jews and the, and the Greeks or the circumcision and the uncircumcised. And there was this dispute that the the Jews who had got saved, born again, filled with the Spirit of God, they were followers of Jesus, but they'd been circumcised, and they continued to be saying circumcision was a necessary uh, thing to be done in following Christ. But the Greeks hadn't been circumcised, and so there was this big, uh, which party would you have been part of? Anyway, I know which one I would have been part of, but doesn't matter. But then at that point, there was this big dispute and so they had a big conference, and they came to Jerusalem, and they sat and they argued, and this is how it goes. And it says there, um, after they had finished speaking, James replied, brothers, listen to me. 
Simon, Peter, has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take them from a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. I love this because I believe that James was a builder, just like Jesus. And he went to a building text in the Old Testament. He says, after this, I will return. I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it. I believe that's what God is going to do. That's the prophecy is that God wants to do this. God wants to rebuild the ruins of praise and worship. He's doing it in this church. This is a singing church. This is a church that wants to praise, likes to praise, and praises God with all our hearts. We're learning. We are rebuilding. There is a, the rebuilding the ruins. The remnant of a mankind may seek the Lord. The Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from of old. Yet James connects all these as these guys are arguing, and he says, hang on, guys, let's just put this together. God is doing a magnificent work, and right back in Amos, the prophet, he said that Gentiles would come in. So he says this, significant verse, verse 19, therefore my judgment, he didn't say ours, he said, therefore my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. Now, this is where we get our vision statement. If you've heard Urban Life and you've been here for a few weeks or a couple of months, you would have heard it. If you've gone to Starting Point, you would know that Urban Life exists to make it easy for people to encounter God and impact the world. And sometimes we read over and you go like, how did we come up with that? Here it is. Verse 19, it says, let's not make it difficult for people to come to God. We've turned that to the opposite of um, trouble in that Greek word is easy. So we've just said, let's make it easy for people to encounter God. This is our, can I say, church life verse. Comes from James. James said it. All right, so now we, we're getting to know him. Is that all right? Okay. Now let's go to Acts 21, last one. We're not even going to get anywhere today. But at least we will know James a little better. Is that all right? I'll just finish it next week. I'm just going to go. We're just going to start going and we'll just keep going. How about that? Is that all right? All right. We've got time. We've got a whole lot of months and years ahead. Acts 21 verse 17. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James and all the elders were present. So what we see here is we see that James was a prominent man in the church of Jerusalem. And so what we have here is that um, in history, and when you read some of the history books that were written in the time by Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat and others, we see that James actually had a nickname. They called him James the Just. And some even called him Camel Knees. Now, I'm telling you now, you would not call one of these modern-day pastors, bishops or apostles, a camel knee. You'd probably get fired and chucked out the church. I love the fact that these guys called him camel knees. Hey, here comes camel knees. And the reason he had this name was because he had calluses on his knees from all the time that he spent on his knees in prayer. He was a leader of the church in Jerusalem for over 20 years. In the timeline, it looks like he could have been at least the leader for almost 30 years because he was martyred in AD 62, which is 30 years after the, the crucifixion. So for 30 years, he led a significant church. In fact, history tells us, and the numbers there would be that the church in Jerusalem was over 20,000 people. People go today that, you know, if you, I don't know what the, the status is, but they, they, they say we, there's now the, the mega church phenomena, you know, big church, mega church. I love, the, I love the scriptures. I love the Holy Spirit. I love our God. He never says this was a mega church. He just called it the church. Why do we put an adjective before anything? The, 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 we don't. It's the church. It's not the house church. It's not the this church. It's not the mega church. It's not the small church. It's the church. And here James led the church in Jerusalem, 
And he led it for over 20 years until he was martyred in AD 62. And a dispute arose between the Christians, the, the believers, and the religious sect, just like in the time of Jesus. And they got hold of James. They took him up to a sentinel, to a very high place in the temple, and they threw him off to kill him. And when he didn't die, they started to stone him. And when he didn't die from stoning, they took a spear and they drove it through his body. This was this magnificent brother of Jesus. And when he comes to open his letter to the people he's writing to, how does he introduce himself? He doesn't introduce himself by his fame but he introduces himself by his claim. I am a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. How does a man of such significance, who led a church of such great influence, who could have had the claim of, I mean, yeah, and he just says, I am, you see, we read the word servant, that actually in Greek is the, is a, is a love slave. It's a, a willing, someone who would willingly make himself a slave of someone else. And from brother to a love slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says to the 12 tribes that have been dispersed. These are the people that have come into Jerusalem. They got born again, went back because there was this dispersion. There was people living right across the known world. They'd gone back, started churches. And over a 20 or so year period, what had happened is that things had started to come into the churches, living in the cultures of paganism, many people coming in with culture, cultural differences, religious uh, beliefs would have come into the churches and a syncretism was coming back. There was this living with things. It, the, the walls of religion had been built. The, the unnecessary in our lives had started to clutter the essential that God wanted them. And here comes a seasoned church leader Paul had gone and moved and moved and planted and planted and moved and planted and traveled. But here was a man, and maybe that's why I am beginning to identify with him so much, is that I thought I would go. We would plant this church four or five years and we'd be gone. I want to plant more churches. I'm going to go. And God says, you're not going. You can plant. You can plant out. You can send, but you're going to stay. How long, Lord? I don't know, 30 years. It's like James in Jerusalem. 30 years, maybe. And then he hears of what's happening in the churches. And so he writes a letter. And it's like an email, isn't it? He, he, doesn't, he doesn't talk. He's, he's straightforward. Like Andy. And you go to her, she'll tell you exactly what it's all about. Doesn't mince words, doesn't bound around, just go... Poof. And here he comes, and, and it's like a, he puts the heading, he says, greetings to all of those, and then here is his, I like to say that it's his, his teaching of leading a church, the essential elements of what we need. But in every element that he deals with, he smashes down one thing and builds the essential. That's why we called it Renovating Life. Because we want to smash down the ugly and we want the beauty to come through. Yeah, we've got a wheelbarrow, a tool, a construction instrument in a sense with the beauty of flowers. Because we're saying it's, we're necessary to get the breaking down and get the ugly and it's messy and it's all of this, but there is joy in the end. And so here is a man that is willing to break down so that the essential can remain. A steadfast man. Come on, let's stand together this morning.
my prayer and desire is that we all encounter Jesus as we journey through this book. As I've contemplated and thought about, I wonder what James and Jesus spoke about when he appeared to him. They must have spent countless hours and years, uh, as, uh, years. They were building, they would have been moving rubble, they would have been renovating, they would have had bad customers, they would have had non-paying customers. They would have had horrible customers that didn't like this and had to redo this. They maybe even lost on some job and made on others. They would have spent years painting walls together, making furniture, doing kitchens, whatever it would have been. Something happened in those formative early years, you know, between siblings. God handpicked Joseph and Mary. He didn't just randomly take somebody. He handpicked them. The Son of God was going to be in a family, grown up in a family, and with brothers and sisters. I believe that that was an incredible family. And then things changed when Jesus decides to to, to, to give up the family business. I believe it was probably the most successful building business in that entire area. Why? Because Jesus was leading it. Some people say he was poor. I don't think Jesus was poor. I think he was one of the most successful. I'm telling you, you're going to watch that video one day. And he gave up success. He gave up significance so that he can make a difference for everyone, you and me. Those years where the brothers and his mom couldn't understand and they were kind of, be, who, what's happening? To then the moment in time when Jesus himself appears to James and, and I don't know how long it was and, and what they said. And, but I do know that for th at least 30 years or so, James was a magnificent leader. And so I've begun to ask God, would you, would you come and appear to me? Would, would you use this book, not just James, but your magnificent eternal word to, to appear to us? Anyone else going to join me in that prayer? Like James, Jesus would appear to me, to us, in a very real encounter that would leave us serving Christ in a way that we'd never have thought or imagined. My gracious Father, my magnificent Lord Jesus Christ, would you come and do an eternal work in me? Would you do eternal work in your people and in urban life? And as in the natural, we break some walls, we move some things around, we reach into our pockets and we give sacrificially. We're asking that in the natural, more importantly, in the spiritual, you begin to break down the unnecessary so that the essential may be built for your glory and your honor. Your breath, Holy Spirit, just begin to, to breathe across us right now. To the anxious, would you come with your peace and guard their hearts? To the confused this morning, would you bring clarity? To the weak, would you bring strength? To those battling with finances, would you be a generous God and open the windows of heaven? To those who have lost purpose, 
to those who have forgotten about their purpose. Oh God, would your gracious hands just come alongside them this morning. We worship you this morning, dear Jesus. Friends, I really believe the season ahead is gonna be significant for us. That God is gonna break down the unnecessary and that He's gonna build up the essential. And every one of us have things in our lives that we are holding on to or that we believe that actually needs to change. And could we be a people that lean into what God is gonna do and allow Him to shape and mold and bring about something beautiful for the season ahead? I don't know about you, but I've often walked into uh, shopping centers or different areas where the owner just wasn't really looking after the place. You guys ever seen that? And all of a sudden there is a for sale sign that comes up and new ownership comes in. And one of the first things they generally do is they break down the old and they bring about some new. And when we walk in there, we go, wow, this is nice. You can see this new ownership. And friends, it's the same in our lives is that when we try to assume ownership of our own lives, we will build the unnecessary. We will make a mess. We sin, we fall short. But when we come under new ownership, when Jesus Christ becomes the owner of our lives, the one that has paid a high price for who we are, 
He says, I'll come into your life and I will break down the old and I will bring about something beautiful. I'll bring about the new. And all we have to do, friends, to um, get to heaven, all we have to do to be under new ownership and allow God into our lives is to give Him our lives, to trust in Him fully, and He does the rest in us. And so right now, with our eyes closed and our heads bowed, if that's you, if you're realizing that you have been owning your own life and there is sin and brokenness, and that is every one of us, but you've realized that today, Jesus has paid a high price for you, and that He wants to take ownership of your life to bring about something beautiful, and you wanna say yes to that, I'm gonna invite you to raise your hand on the count of three, signifying in your heart that you are believing in Jesus for the first time today. One, God loves you. Two, He's got incredible plans for your life. Three, would you raise your hand if that's you? You're putting your faith in Him today. Brilliant. Awesome. Come on, we're going to celebrate with these people. There's someone on this side that's done that. And so come on, let's celebrate. Thank you, Jesus. And what we love to do is we love to declare what God has done and what He will continue to do in our lives. And this is us declaring Scripture, the Word of God together. And so come on, let's say this together. Let's declare for ourselves and for our new friends here. Jesus, I believe that you are my Lord and Savior. You died for my sin. You were raised from the dead, and I have resurrection life in you. Thank you for your free gift of salvation. I am a new creation, forgiven by grace through faith in you alone. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and empower me to do your will in your ways for your glory. Amen such a beautiful and interesting message by Craig and I hope that God will help you transform and renovate your life in this new season that we're in. Don't forget to um, sign up for Business Forum that is happening um, this coming week. The closing date for signing up is on Monday midnight, um, the 2nd of September. And that is it from me and the crew. Until next time, have a lovely week ahead. Stay blessed.